Thank you very much for the invitation to Kyoto. I'm very happy to be back with Japanese friends. And today I'm sharing some thoughts that I've recently developed as an extension of what we have actually done within the Future ICT project. And the starting point is that we are facing intensified global problems such as the world financial, economic, and debt crisis or social and political instabilities that we see in many continents these days, but also global environmental change, organized crime, exploding cybercrime, or the quick spread of emerging diseases. So there is a need to understand society better and the dependency of the main driving factors such as resources, environment, demography, finances, and so on. It's important to recognize that our society and economy are complex dynamical systems. And that's uh, partly a result of networking our world. We now have a global exchange of people, money, goods, information, and ideas. And that has created so many new opportunities, so everybody is benefiting from this. But on the other hand, the very same network infrastructure that have created also create pathways for disaster spreading. Here is one example from the team of Frank, Frank Schweitzer. I think Stefano Battistin was also involved in this. And it shows these cascades in the banking network in the United States. As you can see, an initial bankruptcy is triggering further events uh, that's uh, later on accelerating and in the end there are actually hundreds of banks that go bankrupt and it causes a loss of hundreds of millions of US dollars. Certainly we need to do better than that in the future and for this we need to understand those complex systems better. Now, complex dynamical systems, first of all, are characterized by self-organization. And that means they're difficult to understand, difficult to control, and difficult to predict. A good example is weather forecasting. We know that weather forecasts are just probabilistic. Uh, they're not giving results with certainty and only for the but the time period still, they're useful, and we know that the limitation of predictability is a result actually of fundamental physics, of turbulence, for example. So there are limits of predictability. And on the other hand, there is the problem to control these systems. In many cases, you try to change the system. You know, modifying a parameter, but for some time almost nothing happens, and it may turn out that at a certain point, suddenly there is a systemic shift and your system behaves in a completely different way. On the other hand, we might want to get the system to a certain point, like this red point over here, and simulating here a blood Terra system with a linear feedback and what you see is that we're getting actually to a completely different point over here. So these are the kinds of difficulties that we face when confronted with complex systems. Those systems often behave in a counterintuitive way. And one well-known example is demonstrated by this experiment uh, by Professor Sugiyama and other Japanese colleagues. So thank you for able to show this to you. And those drivers have the task to drive continuously without stopping and without causing accidents and for some time it works quite well. But then suddenly there is a perturbation in the flow. It happens right now you can see the cars are stopped. There's a traffic jam, it's moving backward and we're not getting rid of this traffic jam anymore. So the question is, what has happened here and what are the implications? If you would ask the drivers what was the reason for this, they would probably say, well, there was a stupid driver in front of me who didn't know how to drive a car. But 
physics and mathematics now is better. We have models for these kinds of phenomena for many years now. And they say if the density exceeds a certain threshold, it means the distance uh, jumps below a certain value, then any small perturbation in the speed of a car will trigger amplification and cascading effects. So the next driver will have to respond to this. And as that happens with a certain delay, the driver will have to brake a little bit harder and the next one even harder until cars are finally stopped and we have a traffic jam. So what is important about this is to recognize what are the implications of systemic instability as we see over here. Because here drivers have all the information they need, they have good equipment, they have the best intentions to avoid stopping their car, but still they fail to do the job. Sooner or later, this system will get out of control because it's operated in the wrong parameter range here at too high density. And the very same thing applies actually to many other complex systems. We can also interpret conflicts, revolutions, wars, and many other problems actually as a result of such systemic instabilities. But we can understand them. Complexity science allows to make sense of those counterintuitive behaviors and strong conclusions. So, for example, we have a pretty clear picture, a good theory actually, of all the different kinds of congested traffic states that may occur. And we have a predictive theory in the sense that we can also predict actually the delays of vehicles once traffic has broken down. And the very same principle can be applied to other problems. We've recently done that for conflict in Jerusalem and many other problems such as crowd dynamics, for example. Now, the classical approach is to attempt to control complexity. That means to force a complex system to behave in a certain way. But I will argue that this is very expensive. So the idea is actually quite old, it goes back at least until 1650 when Thomas Hobbes stated that it required a strong state, a leviata actually, to establish social order in society. And as a consequence we have created a huge body of law I think in the European Union we have about 500,000 laws. I'm not sure how many are known to most people or even lawyers. And of course, we have police forces, and military, and other institutions actually to enforce compliance with those laws. But this is extremely expensive, and we can see actually all the industrialized countries all over the world have a huge amount of that. So, can we still afford this kind of system? That's a question that we need to ask and also we need to recognize that such attempts to control complexity are often not very successful despite the high expenses that we do. Examples for this are all sorts of tragedies of the commons that result in social dilemma situations where cooperation would be good for everybody, but it creates additional benefits if you don't cooperate and exploit the cooperativeness of others. And this causes these strategies of the common, such as global warming, environmental pollution, overfishing, or environmental exploitation, to mention just a few of them. These are some of the hardest problems that we have. They're hundreds of years old and still unsolved. So, I would claim solving these problems would be really as big of an achievement as coming up with a theory of relativity or uh, with a solution to some of the biggest and oldest problems in mathematics. And this is where Albert Einstein comes in, of course. So, he said we cannot solve our problems with the same kind of thinking that created them. So, how would we have to change our thinking 
What kind of paradigm shift do we need? Well, actually, information and communication technologies might create completely new solutions for those old problems. We now have big data about human activity patterns. And the question is what could we do with them? Do for society and individuals. And people are now talking about data as the new oil of the 21st century. I would like to point out though that I don't believe in the end of theory. I think that models are the new goal because it's needed to make sense actually of the data and also to make predictions about possible systemic changes. And participation, as I will argue, creates social capital. So data is not the only thing that matters. And I'd also like to point out that information communication technologies imply major risks for society as well. We need to be aware of this in order to avoid those. So all of this are implications actually of Moore's law, which basically states that for more than a hundred years now, we have an exponential or even super exponential growth in the processing power and an even faster uh, growth actually in the data storage capacity. Well, the implication of this is that within just about 10 years from now, computers will exceed the capacity of the human brain. And this is quite shocking because it implies that computers will do many jobs that humans are doing today. And the question is how would that change our society and our economy? Quite fundamentally, certainly more than the invention of the steam engine, I would say. So already some years ago, we had actually a deep blue beating the best chess player. Uh, then we had Irene Watson, who was beating the best players in a TV game show, Geopardy. And now this very machine is actually giving customer advice better than human beings can do it. Also, we know that about 70% of all financial transactions now are done by computers. And that Google cards are just waiting to replace human drivers. So we are already at this point. So that means we are entering an age of information characterized by brain power computing, big data, where we will create more data in just a few years than the whole history of humankind. And hyperconnected systems means that creates an enormous complexity. So in some sense you could say that creates too much data speed and complexity. There is some problems that can result from this if you're not using those systems in the right way. So the question is how to use them. And I'd like to recommend that we should do a transition from a technology-driven society to social technologies. And I'd like to point out that by establishing suitable interaction mechanisms, that means the right rules of the game, a complex system will self-organize bottom-up in a desirable way. This is important because uh, even with the largest computer power in the world, you will not be able actually to find optimal solutions in real time for the complex systems that we have created. The complexity outpaces actually the ability of computers to optimize those systems. And that means even the most the best equipped government in the world, if it wanted to do the best thing for all the citizens in the world, it would not be possible. We don't have the computational power and we will not, never have this computational power. So that means we need to have a different approach. And I will explain how that would look like. It certainly would have to go more towards decentralization. And here is an application and shows how it could work. So we start with a simulation of this annoying stopping door traffic that you often face. And then in order to see what is the reason for this, uh, we'll get out of this car, sit in a helicopter, and see what courses the stopping door waves. 
And then later on, I will turn on a special adaptive cruise control system, which we call a tracking system system, because based on radar sensory information um, that measures basically the distance and relative velocities, we have an automatic driving of the cars in our simulation that stabilizes the traffic flow and increases the capacity slightly, so it will get rid of the traffic jam although the inflow stays the same all the time. So we'll now turn on this traffic assistance system. We see that originally those cars that were trying to squeeze themselves in into the freeway had caused the stop and go traffic, but now actually it's all kind of have a free traffic flow because we have created a connected dynamics different from stop and go traffic by changing the ways the vehicles interact. So, if interactions causes problems in complex systems, we need to change the interactions. And in fact, that can be applied also to more complex systems. This is a very nice example actually from an intersection in Egypt. We can see a huge diversity of traffic participants, buses, cars, uh, horse riders, uh, pedestrians, camel riders, and so on. And almost never has anybody to stop, almost. So the reason is a particular organization of the system. First of all, we have a unidirectional traffic flow. And on the other hand, we have a small storage buffer over here, which allows actually the cars or whatever is in there to adapt the speed to be there at the crossing just when there is a gap in the traffic. Now, this very self organization principle can be transferred actually to more complex systems. And so we have been working on this idea of guided self organization where you slightly change the interactions in the system in order to get a different outcome in the collective dynamics of the system. This is very resource efficient because you're not fighting against complexity and against the natural self organization forces in the system, but you're using them for you. It's also resilient, so if there is an um, accident or um, a building site, traffic will adjust to this kind of situation. I will demonstrate that now actually for urban intersection control, where I will compare three different approaches that also play a certain role, as we'll see later on, for our so, first of all, there is kind of this top-down regulation. There is a central traffic control authority, a huge computer that collects a lot of information from all over the city. And then, like a benevolent dictator, uh, this computer is trying to figure out the best traffic line control. And uh, it's establishing that in the city. Then, on the other hand, we can like an approach which corresponds to the homo economicus, it means each intersection separately controls the traffic light at its intersections to minimize uh, travel times, to minimize waiting times drifting. And then we compare that with another approach which we call self-regulation, where we also try to minimize waiting times, but um, also we look at the impact of our control on the neighboring intersection. So when a queue of vehicles gets too long, we'll give it a preferred clearing. We call this an other regarding kind of uh, self-organization. And let's see how this performs. So what is important here is to look at the queue lengths as a function of the capacity of the intersection. You can see the top-down regulation performs like this. It's okay, but as we know, there's still a lot of congestion today, so it's not perfect. And in fact, uh, this homo economicus kind of control of the intersections, uh, that works much better. Yeah, so it's uh, like Adam Smith's invisible hand that coordinates the traffic flows. But what we recognize is that uh, 
here the Q lengths are exploding way before we have reached the maximum capacity. That means here Adam Smith's principle of the invisible hand breaks down, it's not working anymore, and we've seen similar things in the stock markets, of course. Now, however, there is a possibility to extend the success of this approach and basically the self-regulated traffic flows, that means the decentralized, but the other regarding kind of control that takes care about the neighboring intersections is outsmarting the centralized top-down control, but also the classical homogenomous self-control. So this is very important, and I'd like to conclude that decentralization allows one to manage and harness the increasing level of complexity and diversity of global systems. So I'd like to claim that as the level of complexity increases through the networking and other effects, uh, we will have to go more and more towards a stronger decentralization, through stronger bottom-up approaches. And that has the advantage to, to deliver locally better adapted solutions. So if we have a strongly varying role, which is hard to predictable, then the right response to this is not planning, but flexible adaptation. And it works wonderfully. So you can see while we have been inspired here by self-organizing pedestrians, we have identified a pressure principle creating oscillatory flows with a transfer of this actually to traffic light control and to intersections and that causes beautiful green waves as a result of self organization So we don't need to have a central regulator for this. I'd like to claim that other regarding behavior is also deficient in social economic systems and pays off if the institutional settings are suited. So here is a simulation that we have created actually to prove this assumption in economics that the only thing that can exist is a self-regarding individual as a result actually to the brutish forces of evolution. So if somebody would be friendly, that's the idea, you know, he would basically get less pay off and as a result have less offspring. So these kinds of people should disappear. But it's not completely true. For certain kinds of parameters, the very same evolutionary forces actually produce another regarding individual, which we call the homo socialis. The homo socialis is conditionally cooperative, so depending on how many neighbors actually cooperate. It takes a self determined but other regarding decision, I mean, considers the impact on others. And this implies interdependent decisions network minds. And it's not an invention of your Kelvin. There's a lot of experimental work that actually shows that people have fairness preferences. Not everybody, but many people actually. And even Adam Smith, kind of the father of modern economics, was aware of this. So he wrote, however selfish man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in this nature which interest him in the fortune of and render the happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it. And so on. You can read this in his work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. So I think this should actually go into our economic body of theory and then we change everything. So, next uh, point is that wrong institutional settings, such as anonymous exchange, random or homogeneous interactions promote the erosion of cooperation. They make the homo socialis, that means the conditional cooperator, behave like a homo economicus. Now we can see that here, if the offsprings of uh, the individuals in our evolutionary simulation settle far away from their parents, that means we have a random mixing in the system, that actually creates a homo economicus, while 
if the offspring stay close to their parents, actually there is a chance that the homo socialis emerges as a result of these evolutionary forces. So now the challenge is to find suitable other regarding rules and institutional settings to enable self-regulation to overcome coordination problems. And uh, I'd like to compare again the three kinds of regulation that we discussed before for the traffic control and transfer the principle to market systems. So there is the centrally planned economy on the one hand, where we have a central planner, um, the organizations top down, the regulations also top down. Then on the other hand, we have uh, conventional market economies based on the concept of the homo economicus, self regarding optimizer. Here, the organization is bottom up, but the regulation is still top down, actually, to compensate for market failures and actually the strategies of the commons that I have mentioned. So we have a steady struggle between bottom-up self-organization of markets and top-down regulation by politics. And that creates inefficiencies, that makes it costly. So I claim that when we do the transition from conventional market economy to participatory market society, to the economy 2.0, it will gain similar efficiency gains that, uh, like the transition from the centralized land economy to the conventional market economy. So here we will have organization and regulation in a bottom-up way. Now the question is, what would be suitable institutional settings that allow the homo socialis to strive and stabilize cooperation? And here I would like to propose reputation systems. We've seen that at eBay and at other platforms, the reputation systems are spreading very rapidly in the internet, but we've seen that actually good reputation is good for the sellers because they can sell products at a higher price or can sell better quality um, and get a good price for it. While on the other hand, it's also good for the customers of course they have to be comfortable and they get better products. So, it's good for everybody, and it's uh, time now to create suitable institutions for the 21st century. In each century, we have created, actually, public institutions such as roads, schools, universities, museums, public parks, and so on. So, what would be the institutions of the 21st century? I think it will be global, trustworthy, transparent, open, and participatory ICT platforms. It's now time to build these platforms. And future ICT has actually argued that we need to bring together data, models, and people. The data will be gathered by a so-called planetary system that address what is special, what is the state of the world in real time, not just of our environment, but also of our social and economic Mature turn data into information. These data would then be used by a living earth simulator to address what if questions. So we could look at the possible implications of our decisions and actions and of the alternatives that we have. We turn information into knowledge. And finally, all this would be opened up and made available to everybody through a global participatory platform which would turn knowledge into wisdom by using the wisdom of the crowd. And that would also create a lot of value for industry, for society, and for everybody. And in particular, with the data system, we could actually quantify the social footprint, not just the environmental one, and also social capital, which is a basis actually for human well-being and also for um, um, flourishing economy, actually. And we could create new conferences for decision makers that take into account not just GDP per capita, but also other important quantities such as health, environment, social well being, and so on. Now, why more participation? Well, because
course, then follows from the need to move towards a more decentralized management of complex systems. And you actually see this is already happening. Wikipedia is an exciting example showing the power of this participatory power. We're also moving now towards the concept of prosumers, of the co-producing uh, co consumer. And uh, some people say we're entering a situation not of democratization of consumptions, which we had in the 20th century, but of the democratization of production um, with 3D printers and other technologies that allow you to produce locally at home alone or together with friends and colleagues and partners that you're looking for. And I'm claiming that social media will drive this new economy 2.0 the economy of the network minds. So, we have a lot of global problems, and it's clear this requires a joint global effort, and that's why I'm actually trying to get together uh, scientists all over the world from all disciplines and all continents, actually. And we have about 30 countries on board within Future ICT, and I'd like to recommend you to have a look at this special issue with position papers, 666 pages, food for sword. And please also visit our Twitter and Facebook channels. Thank you very much. Thank you.